Part 11. Northward. Felix joined the crowd of peasants in the courtyard and stared up at the airship. Provisions were being placed aboard the craft, a reminder of the grim fact that all too soon they must leave this place. From the courtyard of the mansion he could see crates, cases, and large leather sacks being winched up the tower, and then heaved across the gangplank and into the vessel. It looked as if the dwarves intended to take plenty of vodka aboard to supplement their casks of ale, for, as Snorri had pointed out, you could never be too careful about such things. Mostly, though, the provisions were of a more basic nature, smoked and sun-dried caribou meat, hundreds of loaves of black bread, and as many huge round cheeses. Whatever else might happen, Felix doubted that they would starve, unless they spent a really long time in the chaos wastes. Of course, starvation was the least of their worries. He had noticed that the dwarves were making modifications to the craft. Fine mesh screens had been fitted over the ventilation holes, which allowed air to enter the cupola. This was supposed to filter out the mutating dust rising from the deserts of the chaos wastes. Dwarves in elaborate cat's cradles hung over the side of the airship and made last-minute modifications to the engines and rotors. Other preparations were being made as well. For the past three days, Max Schrieber had retired to a small tower near the mansion and engaged in some arcane ritual. By night, Felix could sometimes see an eerie glow illuminating the tower windows, and feel the strange prickling of his hairs on the back of his neck, which told him magic was being worked. If this bothered any of the others, they did not show it. Presumably, Borek had told them it was the wizard's role to help them ward off the evil influence of chaos, and he appeared to be doing just that. Schrieber himself had told them that this had been left until the last moment, because the magic lost potency over time. The nearer to their final goal he cast the spell, the more it would last over the wastes. Felix saw no reason to doubt the magician's experience in this. Even as he looked up, he could see the engineers clambering along the meshwork on the side of the huge balloon, attaching things that must be jeweled amulets, judging by the way they sometimes glittered when the light caught them. He knew that the eyes of the figurehead had been replaced with two oddly glowing gems, for he had been up on the bridge of the spirit of Grungni once or twice more to take more lessons from Mackaison in how to fly the airship. Felix had come to enjoy the lessons, and he believed that in an emergency, he could most likely pilot the vast airship, although he was still uncertain whether he could land the thing if he was forced to. The banks of smaller levers had turned out to fulfill a multitude of purposes. One of them would release ballast, causing the ship to rise swiftly at need. Another sounded the horns, which alerted the crew to some upcoming danger. A third one would jettison all the black stuff in the fuel tanks in case of a fire, an eventuality that McKyson assured him would be just about the worst thing that could possibly happen. He had found himself gaining a great respect for the chief engineer. McKyson might well be as crazy as Gotrek claimed, but he obviously knew and loved his subject, and he had supplied Felix with simple answers to even the most technical questions. He now knew that the airship flew because the gas bags were filled with a substance which was lighter than air, and had a natural tendency to lift up. He knew that the black stuff was highly flammable, and might even explode if lit, and that was why it would have to be vented in case of an emergency. Still, for the most part, life on the Boyar's estate in these warm summer days had been idyllic and there had been times when he could almost forget the dangers awaiting them on their departure. Almost. A hand on his shoulder, and a low laugh sounded in his ear. There you are. Tell me, can you use that sword, Herr Jäger? It was Ulrika. Yes, he said. I had a lot of practice. Perhaps you would care to give me a lesson. When and where? Outside the walls, now. You're on. Felix was not quite sure what he expected when he got outside. Ulrika had already unsheathed a blade and was making a few practice cuts in the air. Felix cocked his head to one side and watched her. She moved well, feet wide apart, right foot forward, keeping her balance as she advanced. Her saber gleamed brightly in the sun as she slashed at some imaginary foe. 
He stripped off his cloak and jerkin, and unslung his own blade. His was a long sword, and it had greater length and weight than her weapon. It hissed through the air as he made some practice swipes of his own. Felix moved confidently forward. He was good with a blade, and he knew it. In his youth he had excelled in fencing lessons, and as an adult he had survived many fights. And the Templar's blade he used was the best and lightest he had ever handled. Not with that, fool, with this, she said, nodding in the direction of another blade, which lay in a wooden case by the wall. Felix strode over. He unsheathed it from its scabbard and inspected it. It was another saber, long and slightly curved. The cutting edge had been dulled, which made sense if it was a practice weapon. He tested the weight and balance. It was lighter than his own sword, but the grip felt unfamiliar in his hand. He tried a few experimental passes with it. Not what I'm used to, he said. Excuses, excuses, Harry Eger. My father always said in a fight you must be able to use whatever weapon is at hand. He is correct, but usually I make sure that the first weapon that comes to hand is my own sword. She smiled at him mockingly, head tilted back, lips slightly open. He shrugged and moved over towards her, the blade held negligently in his right hand. Are you sure you want to do this? He asked, staring directly into her eyes, and wondering exactly why they were doing this. A few of the gods must be thinking the same thing, he guessed, for a small crowd had gathered to watch from the walls. Why do you ask? Because people can get hurt. These are practice blades, deliberately blunted. Accidents can still happen. Are you afraid to fight me? No. He was gonna say he was afraid to hurt her, but something told him that this would be the wrong thing to say. You should know that in Kislev we fight to the first blood. Usually the loser comes away with a scar. I already have many. You must show them to me sometime, she smiled. While Felix was still wondering what she meant by this, she lunged. Felix barely managed to leap aside. As it was, a slice was taken out of his shirt. Reflex action let him parry the next blow, and before he could even think about it, the action sent his counter hurtling back towards her. She blocked the blow easily, and suddenly their blades were flickering backwards and forwards almost faster than the eye could follow. After a few moments, they sprang apart. Neither was breathing hard. Felix realized that the woman was very, very good. Realistically, with his own blade in his hand, he was probably the better swordsman. But fighting at these speeds was mostly a matter of reflex, of a trained response which had been drilled into the fighter so often as to be automatic. In this kind of lightning-fast combat, things happen too quickly for any conscious response. The lighter curved blade was throwing his timing off and giving her the advantage. And that was the last chance he had to think about it for a while, as Ulrika pressed forward with her attack. The guards on the wall cheered her on. Did I tell you that I have beaten all my father's guards at saber practice? She said, as he just managed to get his guard up in time to block the swipe. She wasn't kidding about fighting to first blood either. This was not like the sporting duels of his youth, where you fought to display your skill. This was much more like real combat. He supposed it made sense in a way. In a place as deadly as Kislev, you did not want to acquire reflexes which would cause you to pull your blow. He knew, for it had taken him many real fights to completely overwhelm that conditioning. If you had, we wouldn't be doing this, he muttered, slashing back at her wildly. And I have beaten all the local noblemen as well. Felix wondered if she was playing with him. The guards above jeered at him. Since I was fifteen, no man has beaten me with the saber. Felix very much doubted that they had let her win, simply to curry favor with her father either. He had fought many men, and she was a lot better than most. His face was flushed, and he was panting with effort. He was starting to feel a little angry about the way the gods were applauding his humiliation. He forced himself to concentrate to keep his breathing easy, to keep to his stance as he had been taught. Now he realized that he was facing another disadvantage. Most of the fighting he had done had very little to do with this formalized style of combat. 
it had been all in the rough and tumble of melee combat, where you killed the enemy in any way you could, and style counted for nothing. Realizing that he would inevitably lose if he continued to fight in this manner, he decided to change tactics. He blocked her next blow and pushed forward. As they were face to face, he reached forward and grabbed her left arm with his. Using all his strength, he jerked hard and pulled her around. As she went off balance, he managed to strike her blade from her hand. He let her go and she fell backwards, and he brought his blade down so that the point was against her throat. There's a first time for everything, he said. The slightest drop of blood trickled down her throat. So it would seem, Harry Egger. Best of three, perhaps. He saw that she was laughing, and he laughed too. Felix lay down by the stream near the mansion, looking out across the rolling grasslands, lost in the reverie, wondering what was going on between himself and Ulrika. The woman herself stood nearby, holding a short Kislevite composite bow. She stood for a moment, with the bow tensed, in a posture which could not help but reveal her excellent figure, and then sent another arrow flashing 100 strides into the direct center of the target. It was the third bullseye too. Well done, Felix said. She looked over at him. This is easy. It would be a far more difficult shot from the back of a galloping horse. Felix wondered if she was trying to impress him. It was hard to tell. She was very different from the other women he had known. She was more forward, more accomplished in the arts of war, more direct. Of course, this was Kislev, where noble women fought alongside the men in battle. He supposed they had to be able to, for this was wild frontier country with the darkness to the north, and wild untamed lands full of orcs to the east. This was a harsh country where every single blade was required. She seemed interested in him, in the way men and women always are interested in each other, but whenever he had pressed a suit, she had backed away. It was most frustrating. He felt like the more he saw of the woman, the less he actually understood her. A shadow fell across him, and a hand tapped him lightly on the shoulder. Felix looked up, his train of thought disturbed. Varek stood there, peering short-sightedly into the distance towards Ulrika. What is it? Felix asked. My uncle asked me to tell you that our preparations are complete. We will leave tomorrow at dawn. Felix nodded to show understanding. Varek bowed low to Ulrika and then backed away. What was that? she asked. Felix told her, and a cloud passed across her face. So soon, she said softly, and reached out to touch his face, as if to reassure herself that he was still there. The sun sank beneath the horizon. In the darkness, Felix stood on the wall and looked towards the distant mountain. It was still early, and a warm breeze blew across the grasslands. The two moons had yet to rise. A strange shimmering glow was visible beyond the northern peaks. The sky was filled with dancing lights, the color of gold, silver, and blood. It was a strange sight, at once captivating and frightening. From below came the sound of musicians tuning their instruments, and cooks bellowing to each other as they prepared the evening feast. Judging from the number of cattle slaughtered and the flasks of vodka being produced, Stragov was preparing them a royal send-off. A slight noise to the left attracted Felix's attention, and he realized that he was not alone on the battlements. Gotrek stood there too, gazing into the distance. He seemed rapt, and a look of concentration creased his face. That glow, is that the light of chaos? Felix asked. I manling. That it is. From here, it looks almost beautiful. You might think so now, but if you went through Black Blood Pass and marched under that sky, you would think differently. Is it really that bad? Worse than I can ever make it sound. The sands of the deserts are all of strange colors, and the bones of huge animals gleam in the light. The wells are poisonous. The rivers are not of water, but other stuff like blood or mucus. The winds drive the dust everywhere. There are ruins that once were cities of men, elves, and dwarves. There are monsters and enemies without number. 
and they are not bothered by fear or sanity. You lost a lot of people the last time you were here. Aye. What are our chances then? Felix wanted to add of surviving, but he knew that would be a meaningless question to a slayer. Of reaching Karak Doom. Gotrek was silent for a long time. From behind them rose the sound of singing. From the grass beyond the manor house came the sound of night insects. It was so tranquil that Felix found it very hard to believe that this was in actuality a land on the frontier and of endless war, and that tomorrow they would be passing over the chaos wastes through a country from which they might never return. Standing here in the warm night air, Felix felt like he was going to live forever. In truth, Manling, I cannot say. If we went on foot, there would be no chance whatsoever, of that I am certain. With this airship of Mackaysons, we might be able to make it. He shook his head ruefully. I do not know. It depends on how accurate Borek's maps are, and how potent the magic of Schreiber proves, and whether the engines break down, or we run out of fuel, or food, or warp storms. Warp storms? Monstrous tempests filled with the power of the darkness. They can make stone flow like water and turn men into beasts or mutants. Why do you want to go back? Felix turned to lean against the battlement so he could get a view of the courtyard behind them. Because we might get to Karak Doom, Manling, and if we do, our names will live forever. And if we fail, well, it will be a mighty death. After that, Felix asked no more questions. Looking down into the courtyard and catching sight of Ulrika in a long bright dress, he did not want to believe that it was possible to die. Felix made his way to the edge of the courtyard. Behind him, he could hear the sounds of drinking and dancing. Pipers tootled the instruments which resembled miniature bagpipes. Other musicians banged away rhythmically on their hide-covered wooden drums. The smell of roasting meat filled the nostrils, warring with the sharp, acrid taint of vodka. From somewhere outside came shouting and grunting, and cries of encouragement, as the warriors egged on two wrestlers. He was not hungry, and he was stone-cold sober, for he had decided that he could not face another night of drinking, even if it was to be his last night on earth. He was looking for Ulrika, but she had vanished earlier accompanied by two of the peasant women who appeared to be either her maids or her friends. He was not certain which. It was a bit anticlimactic. Here he was, dressed in his freshly washed and mended clothes, his hair combed and his body washed, and he could not even find her to steal a kiss. He felt surly and miserable, and more than a little confused. Didn't the girl even care that he was leaving tomorrow? Wouldn't she even talk to him? He was in not a mood for the gaiety behind him. He was going to return to his room and sulk. He smiled bitterly as he went, knowing he was being childish, and not wanting to do anything about it. At the half-open door he paused. His chamber was dark, and there was a quiet sound from within. Felix's hand reached for the sword, wondering if this was a robber or some servant of the powers of chaos, which had slithered in from the night under the cover of the merrymaking. Felix, is that you? Asked a voice which he recognized. Yes, he said, in a voice suddenly so thick that he had difficulty forcing the words out of his mouth. A light flickered and the lantern was lit, and Felix could see a bare arm protruding from beneath the coverlet. I thought you were never going to show up, Ulrika said, and threw the quilt aside to reveal her long naked body. Felix rushed to join her on the bed. The scent of her filled his nostrils, and their lips met in a long kiss, and this time she did not break away. The light of dawn and the crowing of the cockerels woke Felix. He opened his eyes to see that Ulrika lay beside him, propped up on one elbow, studying his face. When she saw that he was awake, she smiled a little sadly. He reached up and ran his hand along her cheek feeling the soft skin of her face beneath his fingers. She caught his hand and turned it over to kiss the palm. He laughed and reached out. He drew her down to him, feeling the warmth of her body, happy to be there, 
happy to be holding her and feeling her heart beat against his naked flesh. He laughed in sheer pleasure, but then she shuddered and turned away from him as if she was about to cry. What's wrong? he asked. You must go, she said. I will be back, he blurted foolishly. No, you will not. No man ever returns from the chaos wastes, not sane anyway, not untouched by chaos. He realized then why their lovemaking of the previous night had possessed such desperate urgency. It had been a one-night thing, a gift from a woman to a warrior she thought she would never see again. He wondered if that happened a lot here. His happiness vanished, but he held her anyway, stroking her hair. A heavy knock sounded on the door. Time to be away, Man Lang, came Godric's voice, and it sounded like the voice of doom.